Hello. So, um, there was a little bit of a hiatus between this podcast and the last one. I was just sitting my university exam, so that is why I have now, I'm, I'm now waiting for results. So, fingers crossed. I um, finished my exam like two days ago or something. Um, so, yeah, that's why we had a little bit of a hiatus. Um, so, who we've got on the podcast today? We've got Cliff Wilson and Jacob Skipper. So, this is quite a cool one for me because these two dudes, like, they... One, that I, when I talk to them, they both know about things that are kind of outside of fitness and they know them really, really well and they're actually really applicable. They've found sort of other areas outside of fitness that become really applicable when you apply them to fitness. Like, for instance, one thing they have both in common is psychology. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool the kind of stuff that we get into here. Um, and what's cool is they're also really, really good at coaching physique athletes specifically. Um, and they're also, one another thing that they have in common, um, I don't know if it makes them similar, but their education is mostly outside of the realms of university. They're not sort of sitting there with two master's degrees, PhDs and blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't, I don't think I, I think we touched on the level of education at the beginning, um, but it's crazy how high level you can get in the sport, how good of a coach you can become, how educated and how evidence-based you can become completely free of university. So like for instance, myself, I only just have done university um, relating to this specific field um, just now. I used to do, I used to study podiatry. Um, I finished that degree. Um, So it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. I hope you guys enjoy. Um, Sorry for the hiatus, but we will be back regular week to week, um, week to week programming. Um, But yeah, I'll see you guys soon. And thank you very much for watching. Sweet. Hey guys, welcome to the Hypertrophy Hub podcast. So this week, I'm very excited for this episode because I'm speaking to Jacob Skippis and Cliff Wilson. So these two people have been, I'd say quite an inspiration for me because it's sort of like they've they've taught me like, okay, education is cool, right? But like you don't need formal university education to succeed and to be very, very evidence-based. But also what I really like about these two people is they, they make a lot of decisions. I wouldn't say based in anecdotes, but they make decisions based in it doesn't have to be backed up with a meta analysis and they still make amazing decisions that are logical and thought out and rational without having to go through and get a PhD. And they've proved that you can get to the, basically the highest level that I can comprehend in terms of programming and sort of coaching for physique athletes without having to go to that and do do that. And it's not even like that's a necessary component, not that it's not a useful component, but, one of the things that I would like to sort of start off with um, is would you guys like to sort of round up on just both of your levels of what we, what we call education, whether that's formal or if you see other things as sort of like anecdotal education and things like that. Um, and is there sort of, yeah. So would you guys like to sort of round up what, what qualifies you to be coaches? Do you think you need qualifications, et cetera? Um, and then what has been your experience as to this point? If you want uh, to you um, go first, man. Okay. Age um, before beauty, yeah. brother. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'll say that, um, you know, for myself, uh, I, I actually started with zero uh, formal education. Um, you know, uh, for, for myself, I didn't really choose to go down the path of making coaching a career. Uh, when I first started coaching, I was just helping a couple of guys for free at my gym. And I'll be honest, I didn't think I was qualified to be coaching as a profession. The only thing I knew with a couple of guys that I was helping was that I knew more than they did. Um, and I, I knew that I could probably prevent them from making some stupid mistakes along the way. And up until that point, I studied a lot on my own. I did a lot of things like I, I, I would order, actually, I would order textbooks. Um, you know, and have them sent to me and I would read all the studies. I could read, I was reading everything I could get my hands on, honestly. I, I read a lot of good stuff. I read a lot of crap, honestly. And um, over that uh, time period, um, I just started doing well with clients and things just kind of grew and grew and grew. And now here I am, I'm doing it about 10 years later. So um, it's kind of, uh, it's at least for me, education isn't something that ever stops. Uh, you know, I, I read as much as I could get my hands on both good and bad, and then went through the process of um, analyzing and evaluating the information in front of me, and then combining it with what I was observing with the people that I was working with along with myself. And that process still continues today. Well, and then Jacob, what would you sort of, how would you sum up generally your education experience till today? 
Yeah, it's funny because it's quite similar to Cliffs in the sense that uh, 10 years ago, I just started coaching and I kind of stumbled into it. I was um, able to sort of transform my physique uh, when I was about 18 uh, or 16 to 18. And a lot of people at the local gym saw me do that. They started asking for some advice. They asked for programs. You know, I used to charge like $20, $30 for a program. Uh, then I got into PT um, and then uh, I got told that I should do bodybuilding because I had some pretty mean wheels um, and I was already pretty good Nick. So I did that. And then, you know, all of a sudden people started just asking me, you know, how did you do that? Like, can you help me do that? Um, so I did. And yeah, like Cliff, I never really uh, sought out formal education uh, because I stumbled into it. I was studying law and I was almost uh, finished with my degree. Uh, when I sort of blew that off to go into coaching. And uh, over the years, I started getting a lot of success with my clients. Um, you know, here in Australia, we had the IC, uh, IMBA, uh, which is now the ICN. And, um, you know, I would have my competitors, um, you know, religiously, you know, either winning their classes uh, or finishing, you know, the top three. Um, so I had a pretty good uh, strike rate and I have done for, you know, seven years. But over the course, I uh, always put a lot of stock into learning as much as I can, like Cliff. Um, you know, I would buy a lot of textbooks. Um, I would you know, read whatever I could, watch whatever I could. I never went to do like courses or anything like that because I just figured that if I did it in a more self-directed way, I would be able to not only seek out the information that I thought was relevant and interesting to me, um, but I knew that if it wasn't information that I had sought out, it was relevant and interesting to me. I, w I wouldn't pay attention. Mm. Uh, and I think that was why the higher education system for me uh, didn't really work because I just have a, a really low uh, attention span. If it's something that I don't see uh, value in. Uh, so to learn, uh, I have to be interested in it. And that's why I think I was able to learn quite a lot and a lot more than at least what I would have been able to learn if I went to a university um, and I think a lot more than a, a lot of other personal trainers and people who might have gone to exercise science degrees and things like that, because it, it was, it was a bottom up learning experience. It wasn't a top down. Here's the material. Here's what I want you to learn to pass this test. It was okay. These are the problems I'm facing in practice. I care about what I do and getting results for my clients. I need to learn this shit so I can figure it out and solve that problem. And that takes on a completely different meaning when you go to acquire information. So um, that was my learning uh, you know, from a very self-directed uh, bottom-up approach. And I think it's worked reasonably well. Um, I'm sure it's got a lot of limitations, which I'm probably uh, you know, blinded to, I guess. Um, there's probably a lot of things that I don't know that I should know. Um, but I'm sure there's also a lot of things that I do know that I would never have learned had I've gone to university and had the lecture, you know, where I was a part of a class that had, you know, X number of people and I was, you know, just another number kind of thing. And it was material that didn't really map on to real world application. And that's what we do. We, we bodybuilding coaches, strength coaches, powerful coaches, personal trainers, you know, this is an applied science. And I think, um, you know, being able to bridge that gap, uh, you've got to have one foot in the trenches and you've got to have one foot in the books. And sometimes, being able to bridge that gap is um, quite difficult. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that's kind of the, that that's often the hard part, right? It's like that, that bridging that gap. And I think the other point you touched on with the like university education, it's like, this has been my experience as well. Like, I mean, when I was studying podiatry, it's obvious that it wouldn't really relate to too much um, unless you're looking at like foot hypertrophy. But in, even in my course now in exercise science, it's like, there's still a, a decent amount where it's like, uh, this this is not applicable. This is not like I can't, I can't even see how I would apply this, and that I find commonly does become the limitation of that. And this is where I think self directed learning is really 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 important. However, I think yeah. it's it's something to it's something that's difficult. I think for myself personally, and I don't know if you guys have had the same experience, but to become fully complete and well rounded in that, I find difficult because sometimes there's areas you can't even see that you don't know. Yeah, you, you know, I find it actually interesting, Jacob, that you went uh, into law or you were yeah. going into law because I, I, I feel like at least that mentality probably served you well because, you know, there's like a, um, you know, a, a, a get to the truth line of questioning that you take yeah. that applies very well to self-directed education because I, I, I don't know what you guys, but when you 
when I first started down the journey of like trying to educate myself, if you're not going the formal education route, in the early stages, it can be really hard to decipher like what is good information and what is bullshit information. And so, you know, it can be because to a, to a newbie, it, they can look very, very similar. And so, you, you know, it's like you learn, to, you have to, if, if you're going to go the self-directed education route, I think you need to be very good at reading everything with a skeptical mind and saying, how can this be, you know, how can this be pulled apart logically? Totally. I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, so in law, you have to be able to decipher information and discern uh, fact from fiction. You have to have very good, like logical reasoning um, and yeah, a very like rationally skeptic kind of uh, approach. Um, and I think the self-directed learning only works well for individuals who are not only very driven, um, have a lot of like internal motivation um, to pursue like the, the knowledge and the information, do all the work that they need to do. Um, but they need to also be, I think, quite uh, conscientious in terms of how they approach uh, the education because I would read literally everything on a topic. Um, and I'm sure Cliff, you're probably the same. So someone who wants to get self, you know, d- directed learning and do it their own way. Um, you can't sort of half, half ask that you've got to go, uh, you know, Stephanie Buttermore would say all in, um, and really sort of, uh, yeah, make sure that you're eating up all the material. Um, because otherwise you can't have that opportunity to sort of aggregate, um, and, and determine, okay, this seems a little bit more like bullshit. Um, and, and I'm sure like Cliff, um, you know, if you are somebody who can't, you know, be skeptical and have that bullshit detector out um, and use it pretty well, uh, self-directed education can really lead you astray, I think. Yeah. yeah, And you you nail it too about the, the blind spots earlier. Because, you know, yeah. the, the Dunning-Kruger effect with that, you know, when you're more it, uh, ignorant on a subject, you're going to think you know more uh, and then if you become more knowledgeable you realize that you don't know as much and uh, I, I remember the first time I ever spoke on a panel where it was there, was there were like three PhDs on the panel and then me and I was like I I hope I don't have any glaring blind spots that I will you know what I mean it, it, yeah. where, where I'm going to be exposed for not knowing something that I probably should and um you know, and I also think that there's a certain, you also have to set aside your ego to be able to say, yeah. if, if you if you get to a point where you don't know something, just say, I'm not as familiar with that. You know, let me find out. Totally. I think that's, um, that's something that should be practiced a lot more, I feel. I, I think uh, people, given they have access to things like Google, uh, you know, Google Scholar, like ResearchGate, you can literally find something like at the click of a button. So... Uh, I feel people kind of use those tools to be able to portray this sort of like pseudo uh, knowledge kind of, you know, because they can find the information, give the answer, if that makes sense. Um, When it's like, that's not, uh, that that's knowing that's not understanding. And I think there's a big, big difference, right. Um, Mm. Between having the knowledge or the information and actually understanding a topic um, or what you're, you're presenting. So yeah, I think uh, one of the things that, really sort of fast tracked my uh, self-directed education was being able to find people who were trustworthy and uh, very reputable sources of information um, who were in certain fields uh, that were obviously relevant to what I wanted to learn about. Um, And then just keeping up to date with like, you know, what they were doing. Uh, I think that was super useful for me. But again, it comes down to being able to have that bullshit detector um, and still not putting them on a pedestal, idolizing them. It's just saying, Hey, this person through their work and what they do, uh, you know, lines up with the values that I have you know, when it comes to uh, the acquisition of information um, and what an expert should uh, represent and um, u- utilizing those people, because it can be really difficult when you're teaching yourself essentially um, to be able to know where to look for information. So you do have to rely on uh, other people at a point uh, just because you can't um, get your hands on certain information. For example, um, through knowing people like, uh, like Eric Helms, Alan Aragon, uh, guys like that and being able to use them uh, to point me in the right direction for information, so on and so forth. Um, You know, I was able to get my hands on research papers that, you know, 
I would have had to otherwise pay for and things like this, or they could, you know, say, Hey, yes, but this study, you know, this wasn't statistically significant. And like, you know, then I'd be like, well, what the fuck statistically significant mean? And they're like, Hey, go read this. Like, you know, this will make sense, but basically it means it's not worth worrying about. You know, they teach me along the way. So I think having mentors uh, is, is really important if you mm-hmm. have, uh, you know, going on your own, uh, but also being able to use your bullshit detector, not just for information, um, but for the people who are in the fields that you're learning about, uh, yeah. to be able to know who's a, a real expert, who's a pseudo expert. And when you find those real experts, you can really um, expedite the process um, of learning because you're just getting like absolute fire um, in terms of the content and quality of information. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's like, it's, for me, that's been like monumental is like finding those people who is, who have like, like for instance, yourself, Jacob, it's like, you're, you're willing to be like, that's not true, James. And it's like, <laughs> that's, that's crucial. And it's like, it's just like, for me that like, in terms of self-directed learning, that's taught me more than like probably any other facet, I would say. I mean, it's maybe it's the way that I learn a lot of the time is through podcasts. So it's like people are actively correcting me on the podcast and so maybe it's that, but I definitely 100% agree there. Um, in terms of all this, one of the things that I find it's, it's sort of like, I find people like you guys sort of do a very, very good job of sort of weaving together a- anecdotes, observations, and evidence, and well, evidence sort of in the, in the um, journal sort of sense. Um, but I find a lot of the time when it comes to contest prep or specifically physique athletes who are sort of quite highly trained, a lot of the time we have quite limited resources. We, we don't have much to extrapolate from. We, we can only really... I find we can commonly only really use anecdotes and observations. Do you guys generally feel as though that's the case as well? Um, uh, you know, at least one thing I always say is uh, a lot of the studies that are I, I, we have an abundance of studies with training nutrition that revolve around uh, college guys and the elderly, and um, you know, there's not as much with these high level physique athletes so you're absolutely right i mean there are more coming but usually the sample sizes of these studies are not are not massive Mm. Uh, until probably the last few years we've had mostly just case studies of single individuals that have stuff here and there and that's not going to give you a ton of information about what the the broad spectrum of people's experiences are so Mm. you know i i do agree that um you know at least for my so um, I started with the baseline of what I knew to be true in the research. That was, that was sort of where I began um, with what I had been reading. And then I would adjust accordingly over time as I started to observe specific correlations that seemed to be popping up over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I've worked with, I don't have the exact number, but I know it's over 400 competitors in my career now. And after you've worked with 400 people and those 400 people also many times over the course of those 10 years, and you see these specific situations coming over and over again, you're like, well, you know, something, something is happening here. So um, I, at least for me, I learned so much from these individuals and I can see different correlations between demographics, you know, ages, race, gender, and you start to see these differences pop up and then you can start to apply. But then, like you said, like, you know, this is anecdotal information um, and running a study on some of these things would be very difficult to find the people, um, you know, very, very difficult to probably run it over the time course that would need to happen to actually get some solid data on it. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's, it's, it's a lot of the time it, it is a, it's a, it's a struggle to find anything in terms of evidence on these things. And a lot of the time it seems to be reviews and it's sort of, it's extrapolations from what we kind of know and then well, going from there. Yeah. And I have a client. So, I mean, for example, I, uh, I, I, I've spoken about this before, but I think one of the hardest demographics to prep, I, I have a lot of black female clients. And in my opinion, they're one of the hardest demographics to prep because generally black competitors have a little bit harder time losing fat than white competitors. Um, at, at least getting show show lean and then women have a harder time getting show lean than men um, mm. so when you get those two combined black female that they have to go to brutal lengths to get to get lean mm. and um, 
and uh, and so I, I I I'd be interested to see what a study would show about caloric intake and cardio level of solely black female competitors getting stage lean. Uh, I think people would be shocked how much cardio usually is required and how little calories they usually need to eat. Um, and so I say something like that anecdotally, and I've had some pushback that with that mm. on my on some of my posts. They say, you know, research shows that nobody would need to go to these lengths. And I say, well, I don't know of any studies that are done on solely black females getting contest state. Um, and uh, one one woman reached out to me, and she was saying that um, one thing that anecdotally they found. She's a doctor, and she was saying that. Uh, uh, now forgive me, I might butcher this a little bit because I'm not a doctor, but she was saying along the lines of. Um, when she's prescribing blood pressure medication, she's found that um, people who are closer to African descent usually will develop a cough with a certain medication that they use. And if they need to get, um, it, it, they'll sometimes ask them, you know, do you know how closely related you are to your African descent? So they'll give them a certain medication that won't give them a cough with their blood pressure medication. So these types of anecdotal things, and she said, you know, she doesn't know of any studies that are showing that, um, at least not widespread. So, you know, it happens in our field, just like it probably, I'm sure it happens in medicine. A doctor working 30 years will probably pick up a lot of things from his practice that he hasn't read in the research. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's one of those things where it's like that kind of, like those kind of observations, I think generally tend to be where we will begin to actually get research coming out of it. It's sort of like, if those observations didn't occur, we wouldn't have any clue where to go because it's like we don't know where hints as to little gains in progress could be made. And I find that um, that's generally quite a, yeah, that's, that's generally how those things seem to be formed. Um, one of the areas that I find is, as we sort of touched on a little bit, one of, one of the areas that I find we don't have much or any evidence on just because it's, it's, like the kind of place where you, as you said, like studies are very, very hard to conduct in this area. But when it comes to sort of dieting protocols, would you guys be able to outline how for a specifically for a contest prep, what would be the general sort of protocol you would like to, you would follow it. And I'm assuming there's a range of what you would do that is normal within there. Um, and then is there any evidence that you've seen on that? Or is, it, is most of this from trial and error and sort of extrapolation or, um, learning from other resources, or is there any other thing that's informed that approach? Jacob, why don't you jump on that one if you want? Oh, wait. I, I think I can't quite hear you, Jacob. Well, yep. Got me. So, in terms of how I approach uh, nutritional programming for my athletes, uh, it's the same process, but very different outcomes and uh, approaches for pretty much every individual. So I'll start with uh, a screening process where they'll fill out, you know, the typical questionnaire, liability waivers, park cues, all that kind of stuff. We will then have a Skype session, phone call or a chat in person, depending on which mode of coaching that they choose. Uh, and that will be more like a motivational interviewing sort of uh, a session where I'll just have a chat with them about uh, you know, everything that they've done in the past related to, uh, nutrition, training, exercise, uh, their body image, their athletic history, whatever it is that um, is going to be relevant to them as a person in going through the contest prep. Uh, and from there, I should have the broad strokes of at least who this person is and a pretty good guess as to what I think is going to be the appropriate nutritional intervention for them, realizing uh, and knowing full well the whole time that whatever I start with could very well change depending on what I see. Um, but generally speaking, uh, if I have somebody who has a high degree of nutrition literacy, which is most of the evidence-based crowd, uh, so the people who are tracking calories, macros, all that kind of jazz, and they're very familiar with it, we will run with that out of the gates. Uh, if it's somebody who is in the bodybuilding um, world who is not uh, within the evidence-based community, they're generally going to be following six meals a day, uh, clean foods, all that kind of stuff. I will not tell them to, if we're going into a contest prep, I will not tell them to start tracking calories and macros. <laughs> um, and I see a lot of coaches do this. They really, really try to, you know, fit uh, square pegs in round holes and like change people's dietary approach at the start of contest reps. Like 
Number one, you should probably be working with that person pre-contest. Uh, so they can put them in a really good spot uh, going into the prep and have them utilize the methods that you are more familiar with. Uh, and they're probably going to lead to a better outcome post-show. They're not going to get that um, post-eye binge. Uh, they might just have like, you know, <clears throat> easy time navigating the prep with a little bit more flexibility in the diet, whatever the case may be. Um, but if you are going into coaching somebody through contest prep, I really yeah, strongly believe uh, that you should just continue with whatever form of dietary approach that they have try to educate them along the way uh, and you know move them in a direction that's going kind to of more closely align with uh, what you are familiar with uh, as a coach because remember you can only be as effective uh, as a coach using tools that you're familiar with uh, if you've never used a hammer and then you go try to use a hammer well you're not going to be really good it's going to take you a few swings until you hit the nail uh, that's problematic in a contest prep especially when people are paying you good money to do a job um, so yeah, I'm very averse to sort of changing people's uh, dietary approaches if we're starting a prep out of the gates. But to give a, an answer as to what approach I use, man, it's, uh, yeah, so individual dependent. But the process is the same. The, the line of reasoning to get there is the same. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's an interesting point too with the process being the same because I, I feel like some ways the the – the, the coaching process has become a little lost in certain times in certain circles um, because while every, a lot of things are individualized towards the client, you can't stray too far from your, your own coaching process. Because if you do, like you said, you get out of your comfort zone and then you start um, trying to run a process that you're not familiar with, uh, which is going to be problematic. Um, I, I mean, I can vouch for that. The first time I, I tried to drive a car in the UK, I felt uncomfortable because I was driving from the other side. You know what I mean? So, um, but um, so I guess I would say that um, I do have people fill out the information um, on my site, and I, I I have a lot of questions on there that tell me a lot of about them as a person. And we're going to exchange probably several emails back and forth um, before before we even get into what I think they would probably need. Um, so in terms of if we're starting off with contest prep, what, what exactly like Jacob said, I, I want to know what they are doing now and what they've done in the past. That's going to be, that's going to be the biggest indicator of where we begin. Um, and so I try to work off of that from a base. So if maybe, maybe I would like to eventually see them eating higher carbohydrates and lower fats than what they are currently doing. But I'm not going to go typically immediately to those macronutrients. I will work there over the course of weeks. I will, I will make their initial starting numbers a little bit in a step in that direction, but I'm not going to overhaul it because um, there's going to be a certain mental adjustment period when starting with any new coach. And uh, sometimes if you throw someone, and I, it, I, I don't know about you, Jacob, but I did this too often probably in the early parts of my career those first couple of years I had an idea of what I thought was best we're going right to it yeah. and um, it freaks some people out you know too many things are it's a shock to the system yeah foreign yeah um, and, and both mentally and physically and so um, that's a mistake I, you know, I, I don't make anymore and so um, so I start with that base in terms of the big broad strokes that I want to see I want to see ample time to get ready uh, and, and I think that's both physically and mentally. If somebody has a history of not being able to lose fat very quickly, we need ample time. Uh, if somebody has a, um, a history of trying to rush the process, I need to explain to them why we cannot rush this process. Just because you can be ready by a certain date doesn't mean you should be ready by that date. You're probably still not going to be your best. You'll be good enough to get on stage, but that's not really what we're going for in this process. Um, and so a lot of it, I, I don't know about you, but I think a big part of coaching is um, expectation management. Um, and, and so much of, uh, and actually, I, I also read a lot of psychology research. It's an interest of mine. And one yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it's Jacob, when you work, kind of when you work with bodybuilders, you have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I always tell people I'm not going to um, step over the line and start trying to treat people with depression or anything like that. But I, I want to know what makes people tick. And um, a lot of the research on confidence shows that um, confidence is going to be uh, hugely affected 
by how good we are at judging our abilities and then the outcomes of those abilities. And um, so, you know, if somebody, somebody has expectations that are too high from their concept prep, I wouldn't even say outcome related, but even time frame related. Uh, so if somebody says, you know, I want to be shredded in 12 weeks, and I know that's not going to be possible, then it becomes my job to start molding these different expectations from their prep. Um, so I'm going to say time course, and then as far as we're talking about nutrition, then I, I need to tailor the nutrition to that time course that I'm working with. And like Jacob said, that can be so vastly different depending on, on where the person has begun and where they're at. So it, it can, it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I was literally speaking to someone earlier today about it, it can also be interesting too because uh, sometimes in my inbox I'll have a I'll have a bodybuilder I do work with some enhanced bodybuilders it's not my primary demographic but I'll have a bodybuilder that's 250 pounds and his off season consumes so many calories and then I'll have this um, female natural bodybuilder that's 103 pounds almost show ready and there's really almost have to be a like you have to be able to cancel those two expectations out and how you treat one and go immediately to the next because it's, it's a drastically different volume. Mm. And that's something that I hope I, I, I mean, I haven't tried to stray into coaching contest prep athletes yet. And that's something that I think I want to really get a grip on before I even approach it. And that sort of psychology side of it is one of the things that frightens me the most about it. Like the, the fact that it's psychologically a very, very dangerous sport. And the fact then psychologically as a coach, you have to figure out, you have to, I think it's, it's appropriate that you read that kind of, those kind of things because it's like that's the game of coaching primarily. It's like mm-hmm. you, un, you understand exercise science, cool, but like do you know how to coach? Like, i got two yeah. things to say on that, James. One is you'll never understand as well as you can what it's like to coach bodybuilders until you actually do it. <laughs> um, you, you just can't compare coaching normal people through a fat loss phase. It's a, it's a different – it's not even in the same ballpark. It's a different game. Um, and it takes actually, uh, you know, getting hands on a competitor and, you know, in, in any form, uh, or just being there to watch the process with a, another coach and athlete. Like you don't have to coach someone when you haven't coached before, but just like having your, your hands on an athlete, um, it's a different game. And the second thing I would say is that, um, oh, there was a second point I was going to make on now it's eluded me. That's really frustrating. Um, would you Never recommend? Mind. Would you recommend? Cliff, I was really uh, very happy to see you discussing the self-efficacy theory. Uh, that's uh, something that's very uh, big passion project of mine is uh, understanding all that research, all about the uh, yeah self-belief um, in their ability to perform a task, um, and that how that builds confidence. I think that's uh, such an important area for athletic development overall. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's, it's very interesting. I, I Tell me if you've experienced this too. I think that one, the extreme psychologically and physically that bodybuilders go to, but at least in my experience, I think a lot of people find the sport of bodybuilding in, in maybe not the healthiest manner or mental state. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they find it because maybe things seem a little out of control in their life, and this is a sport of hyper-control typically. Um, you know, and, and then it kind of becomes the job of the individual to then turn it into something that is healthy for them. Um, and which is easier said than done, <laughs> but, um, I, I at least a lot of my experience with it. Yep. I can, uh, attest to that. I think a lot of people find the sport of bodybuilding, uh, from a place of emotional and psychological, uh, pain. Um, you know, they have body image uh, issues or, you know, dysmorphia and they have certain eating disorders or pathologies and then they see bodybuilding as a means to an end. Uh, that's exactly how I got into bodybuilding. I was, you know, besides having a few people sort of nudge me in that direction, um, you know, I was dieting and didn't really have an end date with my diet. It was more so I just wanted to look a certain way all the time and I was, you know, adopting very rigid um, and restrictive diet. And then uh, I was like, very much of the opinion that uh, bodybuilding would be the answer. It's like, well, I've got, you know, 16, 20 weeks to die for this show. I'll be shredded and that's going to, that'll do it. Um, so yes, I think that's uh, certainly the reason why um, a lot of people have problems is because they have them initially going in. 
Uh, and I remember the second point I was going to make, James, which was exactly uh, related to what Cliff brought up just then. I think bodybuilding is only psychologically detrimental to people when they don't know that it can be psychologically detrimental to them. I think if you go in knowing that it can mess you up and you, you accept that risk, it's like anything. You jump out of a plane to skydive and you accept the risk that, hey, when I pull that cord on the parachute, it might not come up and, <laughs> yep, I could die, right? And I'll face plant from 1,000 feet in the air. You accept that risk. If it happens, you shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised. Like you, you accepted a risk. Uh, just like bodybuilding, if you accept the risk that you, you could get a little bit messed up, you could you know, get a little bit of uh, you know, food focus, you could uh, be a little bit grumpy, you could be lethargic, you, know, you might not be able to you know, get a heart on and bang your missus and she could get pissed <laughs> off with that. Like when you go in knowing these things and you can then communicate those things to the people around you who have expectations, as Cliff said, that are aligned to your behavior as a person, you can communicate that and say, hey, I'm doing this thing. It could affect this. Bear with me. I'll, I'll get back to normal in a couple of months afterwards. Like, hang tight. I hope you, you can uh, you know, forgive me for this. And you can forgive yourself for, for being that way and realize that, hey, this is just temporary. It's the cost I've got to pay to you know, do this sport that I want to do and challenge myself in this way um, to be the best you know, version of myself and reveal my muscle on stage and compete uh, because I just love the, the process of the sport. And you can come out of that and be a little bit more... Uh, forgiving on yourself and i think it, it fast tracks the recovery process um and and you realize that a lot of those kind of um psychological issues that you experience during the prep i'm also just temporary they're they're very much uh necessary to survive like they're a survival mechanism in prep a lot of the time you know um so then when you don't need those outside of prep provided that you understand that they're kind of like a prep thing that you acquire just to survive it makes it a little bit easier to sort of come out on the right side I don't know what Cliff thinks of all that, but no, that's been my no. thoughts for a while. I've never actually communicated that um, explicitly. So, yeah. No, no. And, and honestly, I was glad when you asked me to be on here, Dan, because, I, I, you know, uh, Jacob, I, I've always liked a lot of your work. And honestly, sometimes when I have conversations with guys like you, um, I, I fully form ideas sometimes a little bit more clearly through the conversation. Yep. Um, and, at, you know, at least for myself, and I, I, James, I apologize if we're going too far off topic into the psychological stuff, but... Um, it is, uh, it's interesting to me because at least when I, so I don't, I, the one weird thing that I do or people tell me it's weird. Um, I mean, I stopped doing, I stopped doing data sheets for my client check-in years ago. Um, I kind of, for in the early part of my career, I was kind of like, you know, fill out this chart, what's your weight each day, your macros, your sleep, you know what I mean? Cardio. And I, I had like everything on there. And, um, finally I was like, all right, no more data sheets, uh, send me your weight, your pictures, and then talk to me, tell me about your week. Um, because I learned so much by my clients just typing it out and talking. To me. Um, and I get to find like what's important to them, what, you know, what good, if, some, if it was a good week, what was good about the week? If it was a bad week, what was bad about the week? And um, I try to observe and sometimes if I'm not getting it from them, I'll ask like, what are the things about this process that are beneficial to them? You know, what, what are the things that are constituting good weeks for them? What are the things bad week and sometimes when you have those clients where it seems like they're getting more negatives out of the process than the positives mm. um sometimes you just need to ask them you know why are you doing this you seem miserable um you know we all go through our miserable phases at the end don't get me wrong but um you know if, if it just seems like everything is a struggle and everything's miserable um they legitimately you should ask them and then they need to ask themselves what what is your purpose for doing this what are the positives that it brings to your life and is it outweighing the negatives and if the negatives are outweighing the positives, then what the hell is the point here? Um, and and I, I guess the one thing I've always kind of observed, um, not with my clients, but I'm going to say with, well, I mean with my clients too, the best bodybuilders, and when I say the best bodybuilders, the ones that probably get the most out of their potential, but usually the ones that have a lot of stage success too, um, both with my clients and the ones that are some of the best you know, in the world, they're usually not terribly social media focused um, because it's not, you know, Brian Whitaker is not known for posting a ton on social media. Uh, Doug Miller posts a lot on social media, but I think that that's more advertising, you know, for quarter nutritional and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't see a lot of Marshall Johnson out there. You, a lot of these guys, they're, they're kind of doing their own thing because it's not for the attention from the outward. It's, it's, you know, something that they get through the daily process that they enjoy and beneficial to them in their lives. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. The uh, the bodybuilders who do it for the uh, social media glory, uh, they're very much trying to achieve that uh, validation from their peers, I think. Um, and that's uh, never going to, to end well. I think that that's where, as shit gets hard, um, they start to crumble a little bit. Whereas when you're doing it for the right reasons, you've got that internal motivation. I've definitely seen like, yeah, those guys who aren't, and girls who aren't doing it for the social media or for other people when shit gets hard it's like it's not as hard it might fit at an objective level it might be just as hard as the next person but because of their subjective interpretation of what they're experiencing um, and they're kind of okay with it because like yeah this is the process this is what i signed up for they deal with it a lot better and they just shut up and get on with things. Whereas sometimes I feel the people who do it for the wrong reasons, when they, when they start to feel uh, that discomfort, all of a sudden it's, it's magnified because um, it, it's not what they're really wanting to endure. If that makes sense and get it out yeah. of the process. You know, and, and that's another great point, man. Sorry, but um, the subjective heart, uh, sub uh, difficult, difficulty of task is so subjective. And I guess I'd point to a few things. Um, I find that uh, the clients that have the hardest time staying on point at the end of contest prep are usually the ones that have more food in their diet. Yeah. Um, because, you know, usually in, the, in their off seasons, they don't, they don't have to restrict food intake quite as much as somebody with that usually has maybe a, a slower metabolic rate and, you know, has to watch their food intake. So um, for them, restriction at all feels almost unbearable. Yeah. Whereas somebody who is used to constant restriction, what's a little more restriction? Um, and and you know, it, it, it's very interesting how our, our mentalities have um, the ability to, this plasticity to them. Yeah. Um, and, and one analogy I've used frequently is that, you know, um, if I, you know, if I came to you, Jacob, and I said, you know, I, I'm from the lottery and you just won a billion dollars. You'd be like, yeah, you know, that's amazing. Um, but you live that life with a billion dollars for five years. In five years, I come back and I say, ah, we made a mistake. You only want a million dollars. And I mean, there's a huge difference. In this. You'd be devastated because you've yeah. been living for five years with a billion. But if I had come to you in the first place and said you want a million dollars, you'd be over the moon, ecstatic, you know. But like after five years living with a billion dollars, you'd like have to make some mental adjustment. Living with a million dollars would be hard. Yeah. yeah. So, so totally. it's very, very fun. No, I agree. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the individuals who are having a hard time <laughs> keeping the calories down uh, and uh, the ones who need to pay a little bit more attention to how much they eat, uh, sort of year round off season contest prep. Um, and then it, they acquire the skill of restriction. And I couldn't agree more um, that those people who have paid more attention. Uh, to their diet um, and have to just out of, you know, virtue of their you know individual makeup are the ones who, yeah, do handle restriction a little bit better. Um, and I've definitely seen that. So that's another interesting observation um, that you were, yeah, quite able to put your finger on there, Cliff, because I couldn't agree more with that one. And then one, one thing that you guys touched on a while back is like sort of the, the, the sort of, I'd like to go back to the sort of the, the dangerousness, the dangerousness, the dangerous aspect of contrast prep coaching, sort of like it's seen, I mean, I, I view it as a dangerous thing. I view it as a, um, that, and like you, you briefly sort of touched on like, okay, it's only dangerous. in if, if it's, it's only dangerous, if you're sort of predisposed to that or that sort of thing, like with that, do you, do you think, are there other particular strategies you can use to make it that you, you guys find are quite useful to make it less psychologically um, dangerous? Or do you think there's, is it not even a strategies to use? It's just things that you don't do, like things that you actively avoid or things that you have to, as you said, like screen for, like make sure they don't have a binge eating disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, for Cliff. Um, Jacob, did you want, oh, okay. So, um, so I think one, Thing that I look out for. Well, one, I think knowledge is of utmost importance uh, because, at least for myself, you know, I've been through the process so many times personally, and then I've witnessed it from the outside. So, at least for myself, I try to spot warning signs early and then educate. Um, and I think that with time, you get better at spotting these warning signs. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I can spot it on my application. Uh, sometimes desperation can look really similar to determination. When people say things like, I need to win, um, I need, you know, a lot of need this, need that. And um, I feel, I usually feel like that's the beginning of, of some issues because what happens if this person needs to win and then they start to realize that win probably isn't going to come. Um, and so, and then even with their eating, um, if, if I see that they're just having binging episodes early on, um, you know, as a coach, I, I've been there where I've, I've started to pick up on some of these signs that I feel are going to be disastrous after a show. Mm -hmm. And I'll just honestly tell them, um, these signs that I'm seeing from you right now are, are historically, um, not good. They're not good signs. Uh, it's going to probably spell disaster for, for you after the show. So I'll either talk it through with them and we're going to either put a hold on it and maybe run through the process a little bit more in an off season capacity, or I would like to sometimes uh, I'll send them to a professional therapist. Well, I'll keep coaching them, but I work within the parameters of what the therapist tells me because, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a coach, I can help with some of these issues with motivation and confidence, but I try not to ever overstep my bounds. Um, at least for myself, I guess I start getting the question of, if I feel like I probably somebody needs to ask questions about your your childhood or your marriage, that's not me. You know what I mean? Like that's maybe where I need to you know throw that pass that ball off to someone else. Um, but at least I try to look for warning signs or things that I see as troublesome, mm -hmm. and then I try to point it out to them or uh, hand it off to a professional that I think can handle mm -hmm. those things a little bit better. And the same the same goes for like what it would be for a a physical ailment. Um, mm. You know, if I if I have a client that's showing, um, if they say, "Hey, I'm a little bit backed up," you know, I haven't gone to the bathroom in a few days. I'll say, "Well, let's try some, you know, some Miralax or higher fiber or whatever it may be," and we try that. But if they say, "Like, I have blood in my stool," I'm saying, "Let's get to the doctor." <laughs> you know what I mean? The severity really matters. <clears throat> Yeah, I think you raised a couple of really good points there, Cliff. It's not necessarily uh, things that people do. It's it's the red flags. And oftentimes, it can be really hard to tease out whether something is a true red flag uh, because we're talking about something that's such a psychological uh, kind of potential problem. It's a potential psychological problem, which means that uh, there is that subjective element and what we might perceive as a potential red flag might not actually be a red flag. Like you know, until you sort of ask and uh, you know, have that conversation with the person to see what they think and mean about it. So uh, very much the same for me with um, the process of, you know, trying to avoid certain things. Uh, I will avoid uh, letting people get into a prep if uh, they are doing it for the wrong reason. Uh, like Cliff said, if they say I need to win or I have to do this prep um, or I want to look a certain way or I want to, you know, for whatever reason, I can just sort of smell that uh, they're not doing it because they want to compete in the sport. Um, then we'll have a conversation around that and I'll start to, you know, tease out whether or not, um, you know, they should, they should be going ahead with things. Uh, also when it comes to the nutrition, uh, if they say, for me, I've got this really weird sort of tick. If, if somebody says tummy, if they say I can't eat this because it upsets my tummy, for me, that's like, all right, we hold the fucking phone. We're going to have a chat because I, I don't like that. I don't like the smell of that. Um, there's something going on there that, that it's not um, like you feel like maybe you're a special little snowflake and like you, you're just like really sort of uh, delicate. You can't have this. It's I, I, I don't know. For some reason, that's a bit of a tick. But anyway. Uh, when people use language around food, like I don't eat carbs or I don't eat this because of this. And they, um, you know, they have these like really sort of extravagant supplement sort of uh, lists and they like have all these um, training methodologies or cardio regimes that are like, you can tell there's just like way more sort of um, detail than necessary. That's not always, again, that's not always a red flag to say that's a bad thing. But it's if they believe that they have to do that and that that's the best way to do it and that they can't do anything else um, outside of that, then I'm like, okay, we kind of need to break that down and like uncover why, you know, they think that they have to do, um, you know, faster cardio every day, uh, then train and have all these amino acids and all these kind of things. Like we need to make sure that that's 
not a real red flag. That's just a, hey, I'm just trying to get everything I can out of this. Uh, this is what I've been told in the past. And if that's the case, then it's like, cool, all right, we'll, we'll educate you. As Cliff said, we go through that education process and we can channel that kind of dedication and commitment to the right things. And that's totally sweet. Uh, but if it's because they're like, you know, very restrictive mentality, uh, very rigid rules. And again, they have all those signs that it could be a potential sort of, um, you know, eating disorder then that's problematic. Um, you know, if they've got like a list of five foods that they eat and they can't eat anything else, if they, you know, go on binge, they put their fingers down their throat or something like that, that's like, okay, we, we're not going to get into a prep there. Um, but yeah, in terms of what to avoid, it's always just avoiding starting from a place of weakness. And those red flags are typically going to uh, indicate that somebody is starting from a weaker place uh, going into a prep. Uh, and that's not a good thing. I always consider contest prep like a game of Jenga right it's like you're slowly pulling pieces out of the tower right and if you start with a very shaky tower right and you that's that's someone with a lot of red flags generally that you just let go into a prep they got a very shaky tower and you just keep pulling pieces out well they're going to crumble eventually so you want to strong with start with as strong a tower as possible and that process of identifying the red flags just make sure that you can do that so um yeah very much the same as cliff all about yeah trying to identify where somebody could potentially, um, you know, have those weaknesses and then trying to make sure that we, uh, we minimize them, um, mitigate it where possible. Man, that is excellent. You know, and, and you, you are right. Cause I, I, and it's interesting that you said that cause I guess I've never put it together. So I, I have said in the past before that determination was similar to desperation. You kind of need to decide for which is which, but at, along with your point, I guess now that I'm not actually thinking about it, um, detail oriented can look similar to compulsion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're a little obsessive compulsive about things. So then you need to decide if that's the, the thing. And, you know, um, it, and even like you said with the Jenga issue, one, one of my most popular seminar talks that I do, maybe my, my very most popular one is, um, uh, I actually relate contest prep to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and yeah. like, the I like that. that needs and and um and I, I actually walked through the entire process of bodybuilding in relation to it. Um, I mean, if we're looking at it, because like you said, the foundation was Jenga. We pull pieces out. Um, I I I want bodybuilders that have a lot of the pieces in order. They have a lot of these needs met because we're removing one of the most primary. We're removing food. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're removing, we're removing a base foundation from that whole hierarchy of needs. So um, if we're removing one of these um, base things, you need to make sure that a lot of these other base needs like love and things are, are also met uh, because, and then bodybuilders also have this tendency that kind of, it kind of makes me laugh. Uh, you guys might be a little too young, Jacob, I don't know how old you are, but do you guys remember those like old Frank McGrath universal um, animal nutrition, animal facts, the universal nutrition ads where they had like the guy sitting in the crummy apartment and it's black and white. And it's just animal pack. Yeah. The animal pack ads. And it was just him and his crummy apartment. And they're like, yeah. just I, you. Yeah, on the and it really glorified like this, like you don't need anything in this life except this process. And, um, you know, people would look at that and they'd be like, hell yeah, that's me. I'm a lone <laughs> wolf and I don't need anything. Um, and so people would kind of go through this process in, in prep where they're like, I'm in prep. I'm pushing everyone away from me and I'm getting all joy out of my life. When in actuality, I, I tell my clients, like, you're in prep. I want you to really um, strengthen other joys in your life. If you have these little things that you enjoy doing, you know, call your mom. You know what I mean? Call your mom. Uh, uh, if you like playing that video game, don't stop playing that video game. Whatever it may be, find those other little joys in life because we're taking away food, which is still a joy in life. You need to find other replacements for it and really strengthen those ones that you already have. I couldn't agree more with that point. And I think that is something that is not spoken about enough uh, in bodybuilding circles uh, is the need to start emphasizing other areas of your life so that you don't have a very unidimensional um, assessment and evaluation of self. Because I think that is uh, what literature has shown uh, in uh, a lot of sports psychology anyway, uh, to be one of the primary determinants of uh, athlete burnout uh, is unidimensional, uh, identity. 
Um, and it comes back to, we can relate that to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs as well as uh, Jenga, that whole uh, you know, sort of analogy there. But um, if you just have a very unidimensional um, myopic view of your success as an athlete and that you derive enjoyment and satisfaction from, so, you know, which is one of our needs, like we need to feel joy and satisfied and all these kind of things. And if you're just tying that all up to your bodybuilding, your contest prep, um, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be very, very like difficult process. Um, but if you start to, you know, spread that across multiple different things, such as, you know, getting enjoyment and satisfaction out of your relationships, um, out of, you know, learning a, a new skill out of, uh, all these sort of things, whether it's a hobby, uh, whatever it might be, um, you start to sort of fill that void, uh, the cliff was saying in terms of, you know, removing food, it's like you, you're starting to sort of strengthen other areas other dimensions of your life uh which i think is like so important as you go through the process of you know sort of chopping down one of the you know primary uh areas in our life that we um one of our you know needs um uh, so i think yeah definitely during contest prep people need to start broadening or beforehand anyway they, they start broadening um their the dimensions and domains that they sort of evaluate themselves um on from a success perspective um, but then also start to really f focus on uh, doing things that facilitate, um, yes, satisfaction and whatever that means for that person at that time, I guess. Mm, absolutely. And then is there anything you guys would like to sort of touch on or uh, recover before we close out this conversation? Anything else you want to rephrase or uh, make sure is really sort of out there? Uh, yeah, I just want to put at one point on uh, what Cliff was saying earlier that he sees like a lot of things in practice we don't have studies on. Um, I kind of miss uh, the opportunity to to say uh, that that is how uh, you know science is done, right? It's like you know it's very hard to you know have uh, what is called you know deductive reasoning where it's like we just have a, a theory and then a, you know general general statement or a hypothesis and exam the possibilities to reach like a specific logical conclusion. Like that's just you know not going to happen when you're a coach like you just shouldn't do that anyway um but when we have what's called like abductive reasoning which is uh you know where we typically have like a hypothesis that we're testing um based on the information we have available right um and we make educated get guesses after like observing a phenomena which there's no clear explanation for like that's what we have to do as coaches especially in bodybuilding where we don't have information on specific subjects like we, like cliff was saying you know with uh some of his i'm sure african-american um clients who you know very low calories high cardio just don't lose fat it's like there's no studies to inform him how to do that like what you can't always rely on the uh, science-based pillar of evidence-based practice sometimes uh, that can only sort of give you so much information and point you in a direction um remember we should also use the science pillar of the evidence-based uh, practice model to inform us of principles you know uh and we should look to the principles to then guide how we apply um you know those uh principles for whatever they are whether it's nutrition or exercise science to uh, the individual that we're working with using our experience as a practitioner to then, you know, fill in the details and put together a very specific uh, individualized and tailored plan. Um, you know, I think it's a big mistake for people to like to look to the science. Hey, what should I do um, You know, in this situation to coach? Because science will not tell you what to do. It will only give you, you know, a broad picture of what, you know, is likely to happen for the average, per on average for the average person. Um, you know, so yeah, I think, yeah, Coaches need to realize that they should have more. They do have the license to step in um, and try things and come to their own conclusions based on what they're seeing, uh, provided they're aware of their blind spots and they, you know, uh, obviously doing it without a lot of bias and all these kind of things. But yeah, I think that's something coaches should be looking to do. Um, and then coaches should be reflecting more like Cliff does, you know, looking back at, you know, all these competitors and picking up on these trends and uh, whatever his observations are. I feel like a lot of coaches don't do that enough. Um, mm. and so, yeah, I think just paying attention to not just the literature, but you've got to pay attention to the work that you're doing, um, you know, and reflect on your success, your failures and try to learn from that because, uh, that's what good coaching is all about. Yeah. I, I guess I'll, I'll finish it up with, uh, you know, a, Another great point there, Jacob. I'll finish it up with one more thing along that too. Is I don't know if you get this, Jacob, because you know you and I aren't formally educated 
Um, and so sometimes when I offer up an idea that doesn't necessarily fall directly in line with what the research says, um, well, I spend half of my time sort of like picking at what the, the bodybuilding bros do. And then maybe the other half of my time, you know, say, stating something that I do that doesn't fall directly in line with the research. So I have kind of both sides coming at me. And so, um, but, you know, uh, so actually my dad is a PhD scientist. He's a plant pathologist. And he said something to me early on in my life that kind of, before I ever got into bodybuilding, that kind of um, took hold in my mind. He was saying, you know, with science, he goes, usually by the time comes around that I test something uh, as a researcher, somebody out, because literally in the field, because he, he's a plant pathologist, he goes, somebody in the field um, has probably already been doing it for quite some time. Um, then it's my responsibility to test it. And... Um, that's kind of where I think we stand as coaches. It's not anti-science to try something that doesn't fall directly in the line with the research. It's, it's something that is yet to be tested by the research, in my opinion. And if the research starts showing something that maybe I've been doing is not effective, then that's upon me as the coach to then change what I've been doing to make it more effective. So, um, you know, I, I totally agree. You know, I think as coaches, we constantly have one foot in the field and one foot in the literature and, and then we find that that unity there. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, absolutely spot on, man. I think, uh, yeah, the the key there is if it doesn't violate the principles, then creating a method or or experimenting is like on the cards. And it's like something that you absolutely should do, uh, provided it doesn't sort of violate the principles and it's not going to do any harm to anyone. I think like it's fair game. So yeah, I really like that. I think people. Um, should be willing to experiment a little bit more uh, in the evidence-based community. Mm, absolutely. I, I definitely agree. I think that that's sort of like a, a missing piece a lot of the time, like that, that being able to, that's like, that is the bridge between anecdotes, evidence, et cetera. It's like that, that, that is where that is. Um, so I w we'll finish off with this. Where can we find you guys online? What do you guys do? Do you guys have online places? Where can people find you online? Um, so for, for myself, uh, my website is uh, Team Wilson BB, like bodybuilding.com. Uh, and my Instagram is uh, at CW Team Wilson. Those are probably the best two places to find me these days. And Mr. Jacob Skeppis, where can people find you online? I, uh, you can find me online because I actually live in a digital space. I'm just nothing more than a bunch of uh network just flying around uh, the interwebs man so no uh e dot com dot au and uh -H -E -P -I -S, and jps underscore education on instagram also that's where we put out most of our sort of more educational resources and yeah they're probably the best three places you can find uh, myself and the jps guys Bonk. I'd just like to say thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you did enjoy this episode. If you want to support the channel, um, what can you do? I have vlogs that I'm putting out weekly as well. So I'm putting out content in relation to, for instance, I just did one covering deloads. Um, so I'm making a bunch of videos covering a bunch of topics. Um, I did one covering sort of how volume works, what is volume, um, how we should use it. One is coming on RPE, caffeine, etc. blah, blah, blah. Lots of interesting topics. So. If you want to find those, you can go to my YouTube, which is James Walsham. Um, and then if you want to support the channel in any other way, the best way is subscribe on YouTube. Or if you want to support the podcast specifically, the best thing you can possibly do is leave a review on iTunes. That helps me so, so much. Or you can just DM me on Instagram at the hypertrophy hub or James underscore Walsham. Um, you can DM me. And you can just say what you like, what you don't like, what you want me to change, what you want me to improve, etc., etc. So, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.